By the end of 1835, President Antonio López de Santa Ana has quelled almost all the Federalist revolts in Mexico. The self-declared Napoleon of the West has ruthlessly put down the Federalist revolts in Zacatecas and Oaxaca in May. In September, he sent his brother-in-law, General Martin Perfecto de Cos, north to suppress the growing disturbances in Texas, where American land pirates and Mexican liberals have allied together. However, in October, reports start filtering back about the disturbing news that resistance has become general. Undeterred, Santa Ana and his advisors plan a course of action to deal with these troublemakers. The president expects a show of force will cow the Norte Americanos into submission. By the end of December, however, the situation has deteriorated rapidly. Santa Ana receives word that General Coast was forced to surrender after the siege of Bejar. Thank you to the sponsor of today's video, World of Warships which is a free-to-play naval warfare-themed game available on the PC. World of Warships allows you to conquer the seas aboard history's most iconic battleships, destroyers, aircraft carriers, cruisers, and submarines. You can either play as a lone wolf or join up with friends on more than 40 unique maps with stunning dynamic weather graphics that make the game virtually indistinguishable from the real deal. The game is not just on the PC, but you can also play on the console, so no matter what your friends have, you can battle for supremacy on the waves together. The best part is that new content is released every month such as Godzilla vs Kong, Popeye, Megadeth and much more. You can download the game for free by using the link in the description. During registration, use the promo code BRAVO to receive a huge starter pack including 500 doubloons, 1.5 million credits, 7 days of premium account time and a free ship after you complete 10 battles. No purchase necessary, just use a link down in the description and use the promo code BRAVO for a huge starter pack. With the defeat of Kos, all government troops in Texas have been expelled, finally forcing the president's hands. Santa Ana is outraged at the defeat and the embarrassment to his country and his family. He pledges that in 1836, I will see the utter destruction of those who wish to betray the territory of Texas and steps down from the presidency. For his expedition, he musters an army of 6,019 men, containing both raw and experienced troops, labeling the force the Army of Operations. The army is broken down into five divisions, under the commands of Ramirez y Sesma, Gaona, Tolosa, Urrea, and Andrade. Once all the preparations are made, he marches north overland in late December, heading for the ruined streets of San Antonio de Bejar. Given the vast distance and rugged landscape he would have to traverse, it might be easier for Santa Ana to sail by sea. However, there are a few reasons why the general is marching to overland the Bejar. The first is its symbolic value as the political center of the state. Take Bejar, he will hold the entire state in his hands. Second is its point of honor. It is a site where his brother-in-law Kos was recently defeated and forced to surrender. He wants retribution so he can uphold his family's honor. The third reason is its strategic importance. He wants to use Behar as a base of operations to rid the state of the troublesome Anglos. The fourth and final reason is his men are inexperienced. The raw recruits need time to train, and selling up the coast would prevent that. As the year passes into 1836, the march north to Texas is treacherous. Many of the soldiers are not accustomed to the extremely cold temperatures and suffer immensely. Along with the weather, the supply chain breaks down almost immediately. The camp followers consume the majority of the food, forcing Santa Ana to cut rations. Suffering from the reduced food in the elements, men start to fall out of the ranks. Those who fall behind are picked off by raiding Comanches, with reports of a few being found scalped. However, despite all the hardships, the Mexican army crossed the Rio Grande into Texas on February 12, 1836, a month before any Texan expected them to arrive. If Santa Ana moves fast, he might be able to capture Bejar without a fight. Before the smoldering ruins of Bejar could be extinguished, the Texans begin the bigger among themselves. With Bejar conquered, the provisional government and military leaders need to decide the course of action for 1836, whether to hold on to the defensive line they formed by capturing Bejar and Goliad, 
or move the war south against Central's targets across the Rio Grande. During the last few weeks of the siege, many in the ranks began clamoring for a drive towards the river town of Matamoros. Many proponents argue that capturing the town will benefit the Texans both strategically and financially due to its position at the mouth of the Rio Grande. Bound to the pressure from these advocates, Governor Smith authorizes General Houston to make a demonstration against the town on December 17th. Though not fully on board with the plan, Houston makes his preparations and orders the expedition to rally at Refugio. The general sends out orders to ready the new batch of American volunteers who are mustering at Goliad for the expedition. Unlike the initial volunteers for the war, these new men have no loyalty to Mexico. They have come to fight for Texas independence. However, the newcomers are not the only ones who want freedom. With an unbroken string of victories on the battlefield, a few Texian leaders are now considering severing all ties with Mexico. Despite Houston being in command of the expedition, the council is unhappy with Governor Smith's choice. To get a man they prefer, the council goes behind the governor's back and sends an order for General Burleson to lead the expedition using his army in Behar and strip Houston of his army command. However, whenever the message arrives in the town, Colonel Johnson, instead of Burleson, receives a message, as the latter has resigned from his position. Nevertheless, on January 3, 1836, Johnson strips Behar and Goliad of men and supplies and moves south to the rendezvous point with 300 men, leaving an infuriated Lieutenant Colonel James C. Neal in command with a skeleton garrison. Seeing Johnson march south, Houston joins the calm as they head towards Refugio. However, just as Houston and Johnson are moving south to join the gathering army, a new interim council names Colonel James W. Fannin as the new commander of the expedition, who is on his way from Velasco after gathering another force of 200 volunteers. By January 24th, the Texans now have three commanders for the expedition who are all heading towards Refugio. When Houston arrives, he receives the order deposing him as commander-in-chief by the council. With little else to do besides leaving, Houston gives a foreboding speech to the volunteers, warning them of the odds of taking such a large town. At the end of the speech, he manages to convince them of the folly of the expedition. As a result, many start to leave, and soon a trickle becomes a stream, unraveling the whole force. Due to infighting, confusion, and a scarcity of supplies, none of the commanders move against Madame Morris. Two of the commanders abandon the expedition and go their own way. Houston, with no men to command, reports to Governor Smith, who sends him on a mission to arrange a treaty with the Cherokee in East Texas. Fannin, now the ranking officer in the field, takes the bulk of the men to La Baya after receiving reports of a sizable Mexican force in Matamoros. Once he arrives, Fannin makes the place his headquarters and renames the Presidio Fort Defiance. With only 70 men left, Johnson moves to San Patricio to await developments hoping to salvage the expedition. Now that a forward movement has been halted, the Texans hear rumors of a large Mexican army marching north to Texas. Only time will tell if these reports come true. By January 6, as Johnson's force departs for Refugio, Neil realizes the full extent of his tenuous position in Behar. Johnson leaves Nil in command of a hundred men and barely any supplies to defend not only Behar but also the Alamo, the same position that Coase was unable to defend with ten times that number. And since at his predicament, Nil fiercely rides to the provisional government in San Felipe, chastising Johnson for stripping the garrison and requesting reinforcements. If there has ever been a dollar here, I have no knowledge of it. The clothing sent here by the aid and patriotic exertions of the Honorable Council was taken from us by the arbitrary measures of Johnson and Grant, taken from men who endured all the hardships of winter and who were not even sufficiently clad for summer. However, despite his desperate situation, nobody is able to assist him as the provisional government is in turmoil over the Matamoros expedition. Not only is the government in chaos, but there are now three presumed commanders of the Texian army. Unsure of who's in command, Neil dispatches a message to the nearest ranking officer. General Houston. Houston receives a report on January 17th when he is on his way to take command of the Matamoros expedition 
and sends his trusted subordinate Bowie to evaluate the situation. Bowie is sent with discretionary orders to remove the cannons and destroy the compound if the Alamo proves to be indefensible. On January 19th, Bowie arrives in the town with 30 men to carry out his orders. However, after surveying the compound, he is impressed with the improvements and changes his mind about destroying the fort. Bowie soon joins Neil in calling upon the government for assistance, declaring to Governor Smith that I would rather die in these ditches than give up Behar to the enemy. Smith knows that Bowie does not make such declarations lightly and orders all possible aid to the men of Behar. Soon, reinforcements arrive in the town. One of the first to arrive on February 3rd is Lt. Col. William B. Travis's mounted company. Travis, a debtor and lawyer from Georgia who moved to Texas to start a new life, has been fighting the Mexicans since the Anahuac disturbances. As a cavalryman, Travis is wary of being boxed up in a fort but follows his orders anyway. However, the men of the garrison get a welcome surprise as a famous frontiersman arrives to assist them in their defense. On February 8th, 49-year-old Davy Crockett, better known as Davy Crockett, arrived at the head of some Tennessee volunteers. Two decades prior, Crockett established himself as a frontier luminary in Tennessee. He fought in the Creek War and used his fame to be elected to Congress on multiple occasions. However, Crockett's career in politics came to an end when he opposed President Jackson. Hearing of a revolution imminent in Texas, he declared to his former constituents, You may all go to hell, I will go to Texas. When the Tennessean arrived in Behar, the garrison threw a fandango in his honor. On February 14th, the festive attitude dies down when Colonel Neal has to leave to take care of his sick family, promising that the men he will return. Before leaving, Neal transfers command of the garrison to Colonel Travis, who holds seniority over the more experienced Bowie due to his regular commission in the army, unintentionally snubbing the volunteers. Unable to control the disobedient volunteers, Travis and Bowie cordially agree to be co-leaders until Neal returns. However, there is no time for personal differences. On February 16th, Texian scouts report that Santa Ana's army crossed the Rio Grande into Texas. Even with the report, Travis believes that he has ample time to gather more men and supplies. However, on February 20th, tensions start to rise in the streets of Behar. Rumors start to swirl around the town about the imminent arrival of the Mexican army, persuading many residents to leave. Even with these worrying signs, Travis is still unconvinced that Santa Ana is near. Later that day, 25 miles to the west, Santa Ana's army crosses the Medina River, the last barrier between his force and Behar. On February 23rd, Travis stations a lookout in the San Fernando Church just as a precaution. Later that afternoon, church bells start the ring, declaring the approach of the Mexican army, way sooner than anybody expected. Shocked at the early arrival of the enemy, the frightened defenders grab what they could carry and run to the Alamo. As the gates close around the compound, Travis has on hand approximately 156 men to man the walls, way under the necessary strength of garrison the three-acre perimeter. The defenders of the Alamo can only watch as the endless stream of Mexican soldiers march into the town. By the end of the day, 2,100 men have arrived to occupy Behar. After entering the town, Santa Ana instructs his men to fly a blood-red flag over the San Fernando Church, indicating no quarter will be given if the fort is attacked. Seeing the flag, Travis responds with a single shot from the 18-pounder, a response Santa Ana easily understands. Angry with Travis, Bowie tries to negotiate a surrender but to no avail. Upon learning that no honorable surrender can be obtained, the leaders agree to fire another shot from the 18-pounder, signaling the start of the siege. With the blast of the cannon, Travis and Bowie have sealed the fate of all those who are inside. Their only hope now rests in the hands of the provisional government, Fannin, and any other Texian willing to assist them. Only when he becomes surrounded does the weaknesses of the compound become apparent. The walls were built to withstand native arrows, not an artillery bombardment. The fortifications lack strong points where the defenders could easily repel an assault, 
and the number of men available is woefully inadequate to defend every part of the wall. Near the mission, there is nothing more than a low picket fence keeping the Mexican army out. To counteract this, Travis assigns Crockett and his crack Tennesseans to hold this point. Though the garrison has an ample array of artillery, they lack ammunition and powder for sustained combat. Worst of all, the stores were not stocked up before the siege, forcing the garrison to eat what they had brought with them. At best, they have a month's supply of food. With the inauguration of the siege, the Mexican army surrounds the fort and gets to work reducing the Alamo's walls. Santa Ana dismisses the Alamo as nothing more than an irregular fortification hardly worthy of the name. He and his officers are more concerned about a relief force led by Fanning coming to break the siege. To that effect, he keeps up constant cavalry patrols in all directions, and stations a division to watch the main road leading to Goliad. However, one problem facing the growing Mexican army in Bejar is its lack of heavy ordnance. Since the army arrived with only 10 small field pieces, they are forced to move within range of the deadly Texian rifles. The siege guns are expected to arrive in two weeks. For now, the Mexicans have to wait outside the walls of the 118-year-old mission. While the Mexicans are digging siege entrenchments to avoid the deadly Texian rifles, Bowie collapses after days of declining health. Nobody is sure what Bowie contracted, but the most likely cause is pneumonia. Whatever the affliction is, Bowie is unable to function as a commander. He instructs his volunteers to obey Travis. Now with command over everybody, Travis gets his men ready for the siege. With the guns now in place, the Mexicans begin to bombard the Alamo. Travis first orders his men to trade shot for shot. However, after seeing how much powder he is wasting, he calls his men off to conserve their ammunition in the event of an assault, except for his riflemen, who rarely miss. On February 24th, Travis writes an open letter to the settlers of Texas with hopes of encouraging all those who can assist him. To the people of Texas and all Americans in the world, fellow citizens and compatriots, I am besieged by a thousand or more of the Mexicans under Santa Ana. I have sustained a continual bombardment and cannonade for 24 hours and have not lost a man. The enemy has demanded a surrender at discretion, otherwise the garrison are to be put to the sword if the fort is taken. I have answered the demand with a cannon shot, and our flag still waves proudly over the walls. I shall never surrender or retreat. Then I call on you in the name of liberty, of patriotism, and everything dear to the American character to come to our aid with all dispatch. The enemy is receiving reinforcements daily and will no doubt increase to three or four thousand in four or five days. If this cause neglected, I am determined to sustain myself as long as possible and die like a soldier who never forgets what is due to his own honor and that of his country, victory or death. Only time will tell if his address stirs up the required assistance to aid him in his hour of need. As Travis's victory of death letter circulates around Texas, various Texian detachments plan their own intervention and rally at Gonzales for a concentrated drive. However, everybody looks at Colonel Fannin and his force of 450 men to march to the Alamo's rescue. Out of all the Texian forces, Fannin's is the largest and best prepared to take on the Mexican army surrounding the Alamo. The men are ready to march out to assist their comrades trapped in the fort but the commander, Fannin, is not. Even with a military background, Fannin is unassertive and struggles to command his volunteers. At the same time, a disjointed provisional government issues no orders for Fannin, leaving him wanting. On February 26, after two days of indecision, Fannin reluctantly starts his men out on the 90-mile road towards the Alamo. For an army marked with strong-willed commanders, Fannin is a considerable outcast. Just as Fannin's command reaches a mile from Goliad, his supply wagons break down, and so does his resolve for the rescue mission. Not wanting to press any further, he returns to Goliad. To complicate matters even more, he receives a report that Urea's force has crossed the river into Texas and is heading straight for Goliad. Now that another invasion is underway in the southern part of Texas, 
Fanon decides that Goliad is the most logical point to defend against Urea's force and stays put. Meanwhile, in Gonzales, on February 27th, 25 men lead the reinforcer comrades in the Alamo. Even though Travis makes it clear that a thousand or more Mexicans surround the fort, these men gamely ride on. By the time they reach the outskirts of Bejar on the night of the 29th, their number has grown to 33 men. The Gonzales company sneaks past the Mexican sentries and rides toward the fort. As the men near the Alamo, a man is shot when a skittish defender fires into the unidentified crowd. Once the defenders realize they are reinforcements, the gates are thrown open and the Gonzales men ride into the compound, increasing the garrison's force to 189 men. The excitement of the long-awaited reinforcements quickly changes to gloom as they realize how few actually arrive to assist them. However, Travis is not going to let this dampen his men's spirits. On March 1st, the garrison throws a celebration for the arrival of the Gonzales men. In honor of their comrades, Travis allows them to fire two shots from each cannon. While the siege of the Alamo continues, a new convention is organized to replace a consultation that has devolved into chaos. This time, however, with the majority of delegates being pro-independence. On March 1st, the convention convenes in Washington on the Brazos with Richard Ellis presiding as president. With the majority favoring independence, a committee is formed to get straight to work drafting a resolution. On March 2nd, the convention approves the declaration, the Republic of Texas is born. Once independence is achieved, the convention forms a new government inspired by the United States with David G. Burnett as its interim president. Meanwhile, Sam Houston has been a bystander at the convention due to his limbo status as a general. Once again, he is chosen to be the commander-in-chief. This time, however, Houston demands the authority of all Texian forces, which the delegates grudgingly accept. With authority over the entire Texian military, Houston works on forming an army to march to the Alamo's rescue. As delegates form a new nation, the situation for the Alamo continues to deteriorate. Mexican artillery has relentlessly bombarded the old walls every day since the beginning of the siege forcing the defenders to repair their breaches every night, which proves to be only a temporary measure. By March 3rd, word reaches Travis that Fanon will not be coming to his aid, adding to the further gloom among the defenders. By this point, Travis accepts the fact that it is only a matter of time before the Alamo falls. In Bejar, Santa Ana receives more reinforcements, increasing his number to 3,100. However, despite receiving more men, the general grows increasingly impatient with the lack of progress against the Alamo garrison. On March 5th, his patience runs out, and the irritated general calls his officers together to propose an assault, citing morale. The officers are taken aback by this proposal. They all know that the Alamo's walls are crumbling, the garrison is no real threat, and no relief force has been cited. They try to convince Santa Ana to wait for the siege guns to arrive, but to no avail. The general has already made his decision. The army will attack at 5 o'clock the next morning. With the attack order set for the next morning, the Mexican artillery falls silent. In the camp, officers tell their men to get plenty of rest so they can be ready for tomorrow's fight. Santa Ana hopes that the defenders will use this lull to get some sleep. He wants to surprise the defenders and get his men over the walls before the Texans can defend themselves. After 12 days of almost constant bombardment, the exhausted Texans welcome the ominous silence and fall asleep, including those who are on picket duty. As the stroke of midnight marks the 13th day of the siege, the Mexican camp comes alive. As silence shrouds over the Alamo, the Mexican camp is buzzing with muffled activity as the troops prepare for the upcoming attack. Sergeants do what it takes to wake their men, either by tapping or kicking them. Once the men are up, they get their gear ready. Guns are loaded, bayonets are fixed, and ladders are handed out. The general wants it to be a quick fight. After quietly moving to their position, many troops stand shivering in the chilly air and have to wait for hours before all the men are ready. At 5.30 a.m., Santa Ana finally gives the order to attack. The plan calls for 2,000 men divided into four different columns to attack the Alamo at specific locations. 
The various units will attack in Napoleonic style assault columns, hoping to overrun the defenders in an overwhelming mass. General Kos, in command of the first column, will assault the northwestern corner. General Francisco Duque, leading the second column, will attack the patch breach in the north wall. Colonel Jose Maria Romero's third column will attack the eastern wall. Finally, Colonel Juan Morales's fourth column will attack the compound's weak spot, the low-lying parapet next to the mission on the southeastern side. While the four columns attack, Santa Ana himself personally commands a reserve. General Joaquin Romero's Isesma, in command of the Army's cavalry, will encircle the fort, tasked with preventing both friend and foe from running from the fight. All the columns move towards their designated attack location in the moonless night. Skirmishers fan out in front of the columns and quietly dispatch the sleeping sentries with their bayonets as they move towards the walls undetected. However, as the soldiers near the looming walls of the Alamo, the tension finally becomes unbearable, and a nervous recruit breaks the silence by shouting, Viva San Ana! Soon, the lone soldier is joined by his comrades shouting, Viva Republica! Waking the defenders of the Alamo. The groggy defenders are shocked at how close the Mexicans are to the Alamo. They grab their guns and run to the post to fire into the mass of soldiers. Travis, along with his slave Joe, run to the north wall, shouting to his men, Come on boys, the Mexicans are upon us and we'll give them hell. Texian gunners cram their guns with whatever they have on hand, cannonballs or scrap pieces of metal, and let loose upon the approaching masses, blasting ghastly holes through the ranks. Those who are lucky not to be hit by shrapnel are splattered with the flesh and blood of their comrades. But despite this carnage, they push on. As Colonel Duque leads his men forward, he is hit in the thigh and almost trampled by his own men. General Castellan soon takes over command of the column and leads them forward. Even though the Texian defenders are dishing out an unrelenting storm of lead, they too are suffering. The Texans have to reveal themselves to shoot their guns and are shot dead by the Mexican infantry. Travis is one of the first to fall as he is killed instantly by a bullet to the head. With his master dead, Joe leaves the north wall and joins the other civilians to hide from the battle. Meanwhile, outside the walls, frustrated as men woke up the defenders and watching a debacle unfold, Santa Ana orders his reserves forward into the fight, with himself staying out of rifle range. Though both sides are suffering, the Mexicans are getting the worst of the fight. Not only are the attackers being mowed down by accurate rifle fire, they are also losing men from their comrades who blindly fire at the walls, hitting their comrades in front of them. On the north side, survivors of Kos and Castellan's columns merge together at the base of the wall, unable to get over without ladders. On the south side near the palisade, Morales' men are unable to get close due to Crockett and his Tennesseans mowing them down with their single cannon and rifles. With such torrential fire, Morales' men swing left towards the southwest corner in the 18-pounder. As the soldiers escape the killing fields out in the open, a new problem arises as without ladders, they cannot get over the 12-foot walls. The 9-pound cannon stationed in the north wall battery has done a decent job keeping the men carrying the ladders at bay. An officer complained that the few poor ladders that we were bringing had not arrived, because the bearers had either perished on the way or escaped. However, Due to the crumbling nature of the north wall, the attackers decide to use the gaps to scale the past barricade. Using the gaps as a ladder, General Juan Amador is the first man to get over the wall, challenging his men to do the same. These first men drop into the plaza and swing open the postern door, allowing the rest of the comrades to flood into the defensive perimeter. The fate of the Alamo is sealed. In other places, the defenders discover that it is becoming increasingly difficult to reload their slow rifles and try to fight back against the unrelenting mass of attackers climbing over the walls. Soon they are forced to abandon the walls entirely. The north wall becomes the first to fall. Seeing this, Texian gunners on the south end turn their cannon around to fire at the wave of Mexican soldiers rushing through the postern gate. Upon seeing the enemy artillery turn inward, Morales uses his momentary respite to lead his men over the walls and kill the crew of the 18-pounder before they are able to spike the gun. Around the same time, Romero's men take the eastern wall and pour into the cattle pens. At this point, the Mexicans control the majority of the walls. Unable to hold the walls any further, the surviving Texian defenders fall back to the long barracks to make their final stand. Crockett and his Tennesseans, 
who were still holding the picket fence, are forced to retreat to the chapel itself. The long barracks and chapel have been chosen as a last defensive position for the defenders in case the walls fall. They have been properly fortified with dirt parapets, strengthened doors, and holes to shoot through. For a time, the defenders are able to gun down anybody who gets close. To counter this, the Mexican attackers turn the 18-pounder upon the long barracks and blast open the doors. The attackers rush in and the two sides grapple with bowie knives, gun butts, and bayonets. Soon, the Mexican numbers are telling and the last Texans are killed, even those who try to surrender. A small band of defenders try to flee east by scrambling over the walls, but are soon run down and lanced by Mexican cavalry. Once the long barracks are cleared, the Mexicans systematically check the rest of the compound by going door to door finishing off any defender they find. Too ill to fight himself, Bowie braces back against the wall and defended himself with pistols and his famous knife, but he is soon dispatched by the attackers. The last defenders to be killed are the ones in the chapel. Just like the long barracks, the Mexicans use the 18 pound to blow open the door and the infantry rush in, firing and bayoneting those inside. Before all the defenders are killed, General Castellan orders his men to spare the last few men, Crockett and six others. By 6.30 a.m., after only an hour of fighting, the battle is over. The Alamo has fallen. Even after all the defenders have been killed or captured, skittish soldiers continue to shoot as shadows as the sun slowly rises in the early morning, revealing the carnage wrought by the battle. When he receives word that the Alamo has fallen, Santa Ana rides in to survey the aftermath. When the general is asked about the battle, Santa Ana simply responds by saying, Much blood has been shed but the battle is over, it was but a small affair. Seeing Santa Ana arrive within the confines, Castrillon brings Crockett and the other prisoners forward and intercedes on their behalf. Keeping to his word, Santa Ana refuses to spare their lives and orders them to be executed. Despite annihilating the garrison, the Mexicans lost around 600 men killed or wounded, more than a quarter of the men who attacked a tremendous rate compared to previous battles. With the Alamo conquered, the non-combatants, a few women, children, and slaves, are sent east to warn others of their fate if they stand up against Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana. With the destruction of the Alamo garrison, Santa Ana finally has his victory over the Texians and relishes in the glory of conquest. Despite the urges by his subordinates to make a swift drive against the scattered Texian forces, the general decides to remain in Bejar for a few days to rest on his laurels. For Santa Ana, there is no rush. He destroyed the Alamo garrison, broke the defensive line that connected the Alamo to Fort Defiance, and sees no other fortified outpost that stands between him and the Sabine River. Meanwhile, General Urrea, in command of the secondary Mexican invasion, is making great strides and will soon be upon the perplexed garrison of Goliad. Santa Ana believes that once word gets around about his slaughter of the Alamo garrison, the Texans will flee back to the United States in droves, completing his job for him. However, for the Texians, the only impact of the slaughter of the Alamo garrison is a burning urge for vengeance. As the word reaches a gathering Texan army in Gonzales, the men are awakened to the reality of the perilous situation. Since the capture of Behar back in December, the Texans thought they had won the war. Now, with the arrival of Santa Ana and the fall of the Alamo, that feeling has been obliterated. If they want to survive, it is time to end the bickering, unite their forces, and face the victorious armies of Santa Ana. Outnumbered 6 to 1, the Texans look to one man to be the deliverer, General Sam Houston. Houston knows that if he has any chance of defeating either Santa Ana or Urrea, he needs to gather all the Texan forces into a coherent force. As long as the various detachments are scattered throughout Texas, they will have no chance of standing up against the daunting Mexican army. Houston sends out orders to all his commanders to link up with his force in Gonzales. However, before Houston can gather his forces, General Urrea makes a lightning strike through the coastal plain, mopping up all in his way, and is now right on the heels of Colonel Fannin's panicking troops. 